Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Wellness by Design podcast. Today we are talking about parasites. We're going to get a little primer on parasites. And this is such an interesting topic because um, there's kind of like two top two broad categories, I would say, of pain, inflammation, and one is stress and all the things that go with that. And the other one is toxins. And part of toxins is parasites. So this is a really interesting bucket. And I'm really excited to have Dr. Javen Moore here today because he's an expert in parasites. Welcome, Javen. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to get more information about parasites out there because they are everywhere and all around us and we're told they're not. So they can lead to a lot of pain and just unrest. And once people find out they are dealing with them and get them out, the healing begins just going so much more rapidly. Mm, I bet we're, we're probably going to feel like we got creepy crawly skin after this. <laughs> oh, maybe. Okay, but you're going to tell us how to uh, how to fix it. So, or at least give us a little introduction. So, I'm going to tell everyone a little bit about you, Javen. So, Dr. Javen Moore is a uh, doctor of chiropractic located in Kansas City, who works virtually with clients all around the world. At age 25, he went from being an award-winning top athlete in college to feeling like he couldn't even get out of bed. He went to a lot of appointments looking for answers, spent what felt like endless amounts of money on tests and appointments, but doctors only wanted to give him band-aids. I know that. I know this thing. <laughs> he later was diagnosed with Lyme disease and dedicates his practice to helping clients get to the root cause of their chronic illness. Dr. Moore specializes in Lyme disease uh, and co-infections, pans, pandas, autism, heavy metals, parasites, gut health, mitochondrial support, and other viruses and pathogens. For more information, visit his site where you can gain access to education, live videos, free programs. You'll find a free parasite quiz and so much more. So we'll share that link um, in the in the notes, but I'm really excited to have you here. It's my second time talking to you because I interviewed you for my Becoming Pain-Free Summit and it was so interesting. I brought you on as an expert to talk about Lyme disease and we talked about parasites and uh, but this this today we're going to focus more on the parasites. So how do you even begin with talking to people about parasites and explaining how parasites uh, affect our health and how they can lead to chronic disease? You know, so in a, a parasite 101 kind of way here, let's just talk about how common are they? Oh, okay. uh, more than a million people deal with Giardia yeah. in the United States yearly. This is CDC on their website. Easy information to get your hands on. The World Health Organization states that more than 100 million people will deal with strongyloides in their lifetime that are currently living right now. So massive numbers of people are, are known to be dealing with parasites. And we're not even talking about all the other organisms of parasites, right? There's, there's thousands of types of parasites. 70% of them are not the big long worms that we always think about. They're the microscopic single cellular organisms you can't see. So with billions of people dealing with it that we know of, how many more people are dealing with it that we don't know of? Well, we're going to get into that and how to test and what, what that looks like as we go. But some basic symptoms of parasites yeah. can be a lot of digestive irritation, cramping, bloating, skin rashing, headaches, because a lot of parasites, unfortunately, I know this is going to give the creepy crawlies of people, can get in your brain. There was a study done on patients with MS. So post-mortem, right? So at death, they did an autopsy and they looked in the brain 100%. So 100 brains were done, 100% of them, 100 out of 100. I'm trying to let that sink in, had nematode parasites in their brain. Wow. That's so, shocking. So parasites are common. They're commonplace. If you, if you are deworming your dog, your cat, horse, cow, goat, chicken, whatever it is that whatever animal you have, your vet deworms them. Well, where do those animals live? Your environment. So you live in your environment. They live in your environment. And you, you might think, well, they're outside. Well, you walk outside, you go outside, you walk outside, then come into your home with your shoes. At some point you've touched dirt, your shoe, the bottom of your shoe or somewhere you're, where your shoe has touched. We are around parasites. So 
I've, I've touched on how common they are. I've touched on, well, they come from our environment. They also come from our food supply. I was just going to ask about that because we get these scares all the time, right? Uh, on, you know, recall on romaine lettuce and things like that because of parasites. And ooh, okay, let's, let's talk a bit more about that. Yeah. And I, I, I want to touch on that because so many people think, well, it's only raw meat. Well, no, that's not true. Yes, raw meat is a higher likelihood than cooked meat. So if you're eating less than well done of any kind of meat, I don't care if it's sushi, pork, steak, chicken, you got parasites in that meat. But if you eat vegetables, especially not cooked ones, so what's one of the diets that people talk about to get well? Raw vegan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're you're you should be washing your food, hopefully, but you also need to ozonate it and vinegar it. So soak it in vinegar to get these organisms to crawl out of it. But then there's can be eggs that are attached to the little crevices all over the food that you're eating. And I know this is not what you want to be thinking about out there, but it's the truth. And then you eat it. And if your digestive tract is not healthy, then you can get parasites. Well, unfortunately, more statistics for you. I love stats. I love numbers, right? I, I did a little tiny study in my clinic and I asked women, especially younger women, uh, because I just kept talking to all these girls that had all these digestive issues. Mm -hmm. I said, out of your friends, how many of them complain about digestive issues? And I said, oh, nine out of 10 was the average. Wow. Okay. So are, are the, those girls' digestive tracts are not healthy. They're not going to defend themselves against these organisms that are coming in through food. So we can get it from our environment. We can get it from food. We can get it from swimming in ponds and getting things in our mouth. That's where GRD often comes from. We can get it from walking barefoot and some can burrow through the skin. So parasites can come from all over the place. So I'm going to give a little tip. Okay. Don't be afraid tips. of living. Don't be afraid of living. Optimize your body so that it can defend itself. We're going to get to how to do that as we go. So we've talked about where we can get it. We've talked about how common they are. I said a few symptoms, mostly gut oriented, skin oriented. They can also get in your joints. They can irritate your joints and give headaches and pain. Anybody that's dealing with fibromyalgia or body pain, one of my top things is going to be a strongyloides or a babesia type parasites. There are some others, but those are two of my top, like three to five. Can you say those again? Babesia Babesia. or strongyloides. Strong, strongyloides. 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 Okay. There you go. All yep. Right. <laughs> so I, I also, I've heard that rheumatoid arthritis, which is the condition that I was diagnosed with. Um, was connected to bacteria as well. Like often people with um, like gum disease can, mm -hmm. it can lead to, um, it can lead to rheumatoid arthritis. And I've also read about mouth parasites and Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. yeah, which gets in the brain as well. So we got a lot of these connections with bacteria, parasites. What's the difference between bacteria and parasites? So bacteria is its own type of organism, single cellular. Um, they don't necessarily, they're not all parasitic, right? So they're not damaging to you. Um, whereas a parasite can be single cellular or multicellular, but they're not bringing anything positive to the, the synergy of your body. Now okay. that's how they were classified. I will talk later about how some parasites are used synergistically. So maybe we shouldn't call them parasites, uh, any longer, but this was back when they were classified long before I was around. Okay. So we, we got to go with that. <laughs> yeah. So we've, we've got some symptoms. We've got where we can get them and to not be afraid, not, not live in fear and try to live in a sterile environment. Cause we know that that's not healthy mm -mm. either. Right. Okay. Next step. So then the next thing that people usually are interested in is why is this a topic now? Why is it that parasites all of a sudden are becoming cool? Right. Um, I do TikTok and Instagram. If I post on parasites, guess what? Those those posts are going to go somewhere. Whereas if I post on boring old Lyme disease, it doesn't go as far. Um, just because right now it's not trending, right? So parasites are trending because they're becoming a bigger problem. Parasites thrive in toxic environments. They like heavy metals. They like all these plastics and chemicals that we are putting into our environment, which are going into our body on an everyday basis at a extremely high amount. I did a summit on chemical toxicity. And as I listened to speakers talk, there are more than 80,000 chemicals identified in the United States. 
there are more than 200 pounds of chemicals per person being brought in per year. 200 pounds. There's more than my body mass and chemicals being brought in this country per year that are toxic to me. Wow. It's got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So these parasites are, are living their best life. They're thriving because we're filling ourselves full of toxins. By the way, you said don't live in a sterile environment. Well, what, what would it require to live in a sterile environment? A bunch of disinfectants. Right. Disinfectants are toxic to us. Parasites are like, thank you very much. Let me come into your body. So, so they come into us. Your body lets them in so that they can munch up all this toxin because parasites can carry six to eight times their body weight in toxin. Specifically, heavy metals is where studies were done on it, but they also like some of these other toxins. So your body's like, okay, we're going to bring these organisms in. They're going to clean us up. Then we're going to expel these organisms and this is going to be okay. The problem is that would work if you had a one-time exposure. And the body's intelligent. It's smart. It does this on purpose. Mm -hmm. But then that one-time exposure turns into two and three, and then every day, all day. So then parasites are just like, you are an amazing host. I'm never leaving. I'm going to keep eating this stuff. Then I'm going to proliferate. I'm going to, I'm going to make more of myself. I'm going to reproduce. Mm. As they reproduce, then they can overwhelm your detox pathways. They can get literally inside your liver, your lymph, your muscles, your tissue. And then they, they, because you have so many, they're irritating the tissue, creating more inflammation and causing more pain. Well, I'm not even talking about the fact that parasites themselves have waste. They're supposed to be cleaning up the waste that's in us. And now they have waste. So they poop. Right. And then, then that's toxic in our, our environment. That's toxic inside of us. So now you have an endotoxin or a neurotoxin from the parasite that can cause us issues. So now we're doubling down on a problem and it gets worse and worse and worse, but that's why parasites are in us. The secondary reason why is until the forties, fifties, especially in rural America, when you dewormed your cows, you took a little yourself. I've still got patients that did it. That tell me about it. Really? Yes. Wow. wow. In third that's world so countries right now, I had a client call me from Sri Lanka and she's like, yeah, we deworm twice a year. We should be good with that one, right? I'm like, well, maybe. Um, clients from Colombia and Mexico, they still deworm prescription from their doctors. Just like you go to the dentist twice a year, they go and they do this twice a year. It's over the counter. Interesting, the cultural differences like that. But we're too clean. I'm yeah. My body is a sterile environment that doesn't have organisms. That's a complete lie, by the way. We have all kinds of bacteria and parasites and viruses and they're normal and acceptable and okay and wanted because we will not survive without them. But they have to be within that equilibrium and balance. And because of our toxic environment and the overabundance of stress that we live in, we are not moderating them. So we have to do something to moderate them, which would be to cleanse a couple of times a year. And it's not being done, especially in westernized countries. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, not many people really go through a regular cleanse ordinary people. So is that something you recommend then that people do once or twice a year? I thought I was supposed to save that to the end. Okay. Yes. All right. We'll, yes. we'll get to it. We'll get to it. Yes, I do. But that is going to be my recommendation at the end of all this is you should do minimally twice a year. I personally think you should do quarterly a full moon parasite cleanse, which if you don't know what that is, I have an entire course on it that I've built and, and it's a cheap course because it's just teaching you how to do a quarterly parasite cleanse, addressing the target is addressing different types of organisms because there's small ones, there's worm ones, and then there's invisible or single cellular ones. So we got to address them a little differently and doing a quarterly cleanse to keep up with getting your body to stay well. And I've got it all built out. And it is something that I do recommend people do. I do it myself. Uh, my clients tend to do it after we've gotten them well, just to stay there and stay from letting organisms come and make you a host. Mm, well, you've inspired me. I want, I want to do that. Let's back up a little bit since I made you go like too far ahead. Let's go talk again uh, a little bit about prevention. Can we do that? Absolutely. So prevention comes back to what, well, probably a lot of your speakers talk about, right? So they talk about making sure that your environment is clean as far as toxicities, toxins, toxicants. So 
-hmm. whether it's the wall behind me with the paint VOCs coming off, which by the way, one way to help yourself is this paint was non-VOC. It doesn't allow those volatile organic compounds to get out into the environment so I can breathe them and they're toxic to my body, slowing my mitochondria, reducing my immune system, not allowing for me to be able to fight back against parasites. Some other things that we've got to be able to pay attention to is mold, because mold can be in that wall too. Mold can cause mold can cause suppression of the immune system, but parasites also can feed on mold. Okay. Then you have, you know, stress in the world, which can strain out, stress our bodies out. And then you have some of my other favorites are antibiotic therapies. If we wipe out all the bacteria in our digestive tract, it does make us more vulnerable to parasites. So remember I was saying, if you eat it, it goes into your body, through your digestive tract, into where the HCL is supposed to be. That's, your, that's where your stomach is, HCL. Mm -hmm. If you're taking an antacid or if you have a compromised autonomic nervous system, which is your, your nervous system that is more subconscious. If it's compromised by too much stress, you don't produce as much acid in your stomach. Right. If you're not producing this acid in your stomach, whether it be medication or stress or some other reason, then parasites are not getting burnt up as they're going down because they're supposed to be burnt up. That hydrochloric acid is supposed to melt away the egg or the parasite to kill it. Mm-hmm. And then it goes in the digestive tract and it can become an infection. So in the digestive tract, you have your second line of defense. That second line of defense are specific named bacteria. We have studies on these now. And I actually did a entire presentation on this for Lindsay Elmore on her uh, engineering the microbiome summit. So please don't ask me to, to quote off the, the names now, but in my research I found, and it would be like lactobacillus and it would just be a bunch of numbers. It would be 16743D. And there would be a, a specific strain of bacteria that they've identified in our digestive tract that will repel strongyloides or repel giardia. Wow, so if you've taken a bunch of antibiotics, it's wiped that out potentially, and now you're more vulnerable. So replenishing your microbiome is going to be key as creating this defense. And you, you, that needs to be done with a probiotic of, of choice. So at this point, we don't have a probiotic that is specific to those strains of bacteria. Okay. So it's more on the prebiotic side of things. So we want to figure out what do those bacteria eat, which again, we're so early in research, we don't exactly know. Um, but we want to give a wide variety. So a broad spectrum of prebiotics, fermented foods, so that we can feed those bacteria likely be able to feed those bacteria the most, but that's just in general for all things. We want to feed the bacteria in our gut with as many prebiotics and fermented foods as possible because that variety is key for the growth of a, a healthy full microbiome. Can you give the audience um, an, some uh, a list of some prebiotic foods? So prebiotic foods are going to be your fibers. Mm -hmm. So anything that's fibrous, a lot of vegetables and grains can be in that category if you can tolerate them. So there's always the if, right? So if you're gluten intolerant, don't go eating gluten, trying to, to, to feed the, uh, the microbiome. But then you can also get supplements. So uh, Megaspore Biotic, um, that company, Microbiome Labs, they have a lot of prebiotics that they use. Um, I use a few of them like Mega Pre, uh, fermented foods like sauerkraut is one that a lot of clients will make at home. That's probably the one that I've had the most of. You can get some in like your Greek yogurts if you don't have the dairy intolerances. Other people are gonna be using, um, I'm trying to bring to my brain the word, but I think it's a kimchi, which would oh, be yeah, more kimchi. of the, the Asian fermented yeah, soy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I, what about kombucha? Yeah, kombucha can be a good one. Um, I My only drawback on kombucha is this is the no sugar added version, please. Mm -hmm. A lot of clients will uh, go to the grocery store and buy it. And it's like 40 grams of sugar in your fermented food. I'm like, ah, oh, no, that's not what we're looking for. That's going to feed the yeast and the parasites. So if you make it at home, go for it. Phenomenal. Just don't pour the sugar in it. Yeah. 
Okay. And, and so the prebiotic vegetables specifically are, are what vegetables uh, or, or is it all fiber. vegetables? <laughs> so prebiotics can be the ones with the fiber and cellulose, right? So okay. um, just looking at your green foods, the more fiber in there, the better. I, I'm not the type that uh, I get really deep into that kind of conversation okay. with my clients. So what I tell my clients is just go to the grocery store. If you haven't had that food in a while, eat it. Now, this is the organic natural vegetables section, not the candy section. Don't go for what you haven't had recently there. Um, and if you've never had it, try that because that's going to be a food that your microbiome might be fed by because it's not used to it. Right. And those new fibers, those new nutrients and uh, proteins, those new phytonutrients are going to be so important for your body to be able to use in its different types of bacteria. Mm -hmm. So that's what I usually end up telling my clients to do. Okay, so variety of foods and don't, and obviously the medications are a problem because we're reducing the hydrochloric acid in, in the stomach area. Do you recommend um, for some people, I guess with proper testing to take extra hydrochloric acid for if, if they know that they don't have enough? There is a time and place for that. I tend to refrain from it early in protocols because with a lot of the clients that I'm working with, their gut is pretty beat up because parasites, bacteria, toxins from the environment, foods that they've been allergic to. And if the digestive tract is very vulnerable with a low mucus amount, or we have colitis, irritations, inflammation in the gut, mm -hmm. and you take hydrochloric acid or digestive enzymes, it can actually adversely affect the digestive tract. So although over time, I do want that acid and that uh, enzyme to go back up. Once we've healed and sealed, absolutely, we can use those enzymes. Like Prior that. to healing and sealing, I get a little bit concerned, although there are times where maybe a serapeptase or an adikinase, uh, which are biofilm disruptors that will pull the biofilms off of parasites. I may use those here and there. Mm -hmm. I definitely want to make sure that we have supported the gut first. Okay. All right. So let's talk about that then. How, how do you do the heal and seal and support the gut? Step one is always going to be stop bringing in foods that we're allergic to. Mm. Now, I don't tend to run a big panel unless I used to. What I found out is people, some people were allergic to literally every food in the panel. Because they're like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, we have leaky gut. We have mast cell. We have chronic inflammatory response syndrome. It's not worth it for me to run these labs anymore is where what I got to. So I said, if you eat a food and you know without a doubt every time you eat that food, it's a problem, stop. Mm -hmm. If it's gluten or dairy, you probably should just stop. But otherwise, let's not waste money there or use some of your resources and money there. And let's also not increase the stress of, right. I can only have five foods. I know, it's so hard on people. So let's get in there with things like, Glutamine, butyrate, zinc. Some other things I like to use would be quercetin, mm -hmm. uh, colostrum in those who don't have autoimmune situations. Oh, why, those, why, why do you exclude colostrum for people with autoimmune? If you have, well, colostrum one is immune regulatory to some degree, right? So we're, we're putting colostrum in um, milk for the immune response. So if you're autoimmune and we're in a flare state and you put in colostrum, I've seen a lot of negative response, a lot of flare ups. Okay. Did not know that. Now over time, it absolutely can become a part of the process once we are more stable. Okay. So in the very autoimmune population, it's more of your glutamine, butyrate, zinc, maybe some ginger. Um, I don't even use a lot of the herbs. Once we get into the, the less autoimmune or the more calm, you can add in the Spanish moss, slippery elm uh, type herbs with the colostrums in there to, to take it to another level of seal. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you've got to get rid of why the seal is broke, which the food allergies were a part, the toxins you're ingesting is a part, but the infections have to be removed for it to be a done deal. Right. So we got to remove irritants go after the infections 
and then heal and seal throughout that process. Mm. And how do you go about um, getting rid of the infections? So that's where it comes to step one is usually parasites for gut infections. That is usually my step one. I have a lot of favorite products because, well, I wish I could use one, but it seems that uh, it's not the way it works. So I've got about 10 to 12 different antimicrobials, more toward the parasite side, uh, pair of one, two, three, and four from Cellcor. And each one's going to be used a little bit differently. So a pair of four, I use more for uh, fungus, which is not a parasite, but also for nematodes. Pair of three is for more of the nematodes and the helmets, which are the worms. Pair of two is more for the helmets. And pair of one is more for the rope worm and just to stick to all that stuff and pull it out because it's kind of like a glue. Mm. So I also use Byron White's formulas. He has a few AP, AHP, which is more for the bacteria side. I have uh, Barlow Herbal. I use Clarkia and Vermicide and a, a large number of other companies. I've got so many that I pull from, but those are probably some of my favorites, most commons. I feel like I'm going to need to study after this and go research each of these things and see uh, what they all are. It's so fascinating, Javen. Oh my gosh. Okay. So do you, do you run a, pan, a panel of tests? I know you said you don't do it for the food sensitivities or allergies, but do you do a panel of tests to figure out what someone might have, or is it based more on symptomology? So I did run a bunch of stool samples at one point. I've, I've seen hundreds, maybe thousands of stool samples at this point, as far as the results, they just don't the pick up samples. parasites. <laughs> Yeah, not the samples. Thank, thankfully, they're not having to send them here and then out. Um, but the, the parasites just aren't picked up. And there's some reasons why, right? So if you're a, and this is where I take it back to the, you know, I don't have parasites person. I've heard this a lot. I'm a vegan that lives in a cold environment. And so I, I shouldn't have parasites because I'm not out in the lake. I'm not out digging in the dirt and um, I don't eat meat. Okay. Where does all the, where do those vegetables come from? Because it's not where you're at, right? So they're coming from everywhere else, Mexico, Cambodia, Colombia, India, right? They're coming from warm environments mm -hmm. and you're shipping them in and guess what's coming with them? Our little friends, the parasites. Yeah. They're not getting so, in the border. Yeah. They're not stopping. They don't care about border laws, right? So they're coming right along and now you get this beautiful salad with all sorts of yummy things in it. And along with that is some parasites from other places. Well, the stool samples you're running for you are probably designed for people that eat food around you. Right, so now, they're not gonna be testing for those particular parasites? They're not testing for everything in the world. No, no test tests for every parasite in the world. There's just right. not. There's another problem is if I test your stool, but I send it to a veterinary clinic and I say, this is from my dog. Guess what they're going to find? Parasites. Have but you if you this? say it's from a human, often they don't. And you can't tell a veterinarian, you can't tell a, a college that because they just, that it just doesn't work. They get mad at you if you lie, obviously, but they get mad at you because they're not supposed to say certain things or test certain ways or look for certain infections. The problem is, is it's the reality. So although I've done the stool samples and every now and then you get a, the test, it's just not going to be accurate. There are other testings that you can do for, for parasites. You can get a spinal tap, which is a riskier procedure, but it does have a higher likelihood of being positive with, if you have parasites. Wow. Uh, I, I believe they say it's about 25% of the time it's accurate. Stool sample being a lot less. And then I, there's some markers that I just look for in general. If you have a high C-reactive protein, something's inflaming your body. Parasites are a possibility. If your eosinophils are elevated, likely you have a parasite. If your liver enzymes are elevated and you don't have some sort of liver virus, you probably have a parasite. So those are some of the things that, that I kind of look for going down the list. And then I, I just do a long symptom survey, which you even mentioned at the start, it's free on my website to say, you know, do you have a parasite? Fill this out. And if it tests high, might be something you consider working on. Hmm. Wow, so, so fascinating. Um, People aren't necessarily thinking that parasites could be the problem with their aches and pains, right? Um, or other, or skin issues, or or brain issues, or gut issues. 
So uh, very, very interesting. So let's let's uh, go back to where you were before. I think we're there now, like the how you how people would how you help people treat them. And that's what you talked about, like doing going to your website, doing this questionnaire and uh, and then what? So from there, I end up running several labs on people. Uh, we run organic acid tests, we run blood tests, hair tests. We're looking for, you know, what is in your body? Do you have normal cellular function? Do you have normal mitochondrial function? So does your body have the ability to defend itself? Mm -hmm. A lot of people that I work with, there's some compromise there. There's also toxins there that are feeding the parasites. And then there are signs of parasites throughout or other things, mold, lime, et cetera. Now, after we go through the interpretation of all these labs and the surveys and the symptoms, uh, we're able to put together a protocol. About 70% of the time, parasites are the forefront of the first infection that I'm going to work on. Not necessarily the, the, the first place for all of it to go, but the first infection for sure. So that's where we usually start. And I start at the more gentle side of things. So we start by not necessarily just going right after infection and trying to kill it. We go after and say, okay, we got to get the drainage open. So we got to make sure everything can come out. You got to be able to poop. Right. Once you're able to poop, you're able to drain. That's when we start going and bring in the antimicrobials. Um, this is assuming you're not mast cell or chronic inflammatory response where you're going to react negatively, very strong. Um, if so, we have a whole protocol designed around that. So once we bring in the, the parasite antimicrobials, we may do those for two to three months straight, not with the idea of eradication, but with the idea of bringing back into balance. Right. Once we get back in balance for parasites or closer, that's when we're going to step over to the next side. Okay. Were there bacteria? Were there other organisms or toxins that we need to work on? Because I can tell you what, sometimes you run out of parasites coming out, right? So somebody's like, I see... 10 foot of parasite coming out a week. And I've had guys measure it. I had one who was 300 foot a month for like six months. Oh my goodness. That kind of blows my mind. And then we switched because it kind of came to a halt where it wasn't as much. It was still a little bit, but wasn't as much. And then we went over to bacteria and we saw a little bit. We went over to metal, saw a little bit. When we address mold, when we removed the food for the parasites, he had a month, a record month. It was like 500 foot. So and, he's and poop, pooping out parasites. Pooping out parasites. And then he's playing with his poop and he's measuring it on a measuring tape because you know what? He was probably one of my favorite clients just because of the goofy <laughs> things that he would do. And I loved it. I loved it. I was like, dude, you're awesome. Cause like all this research that I'm getting right now, like he was, he wanted labs all the time. We were researching the heck out of stuff. It was just great. It was so much information for me. Um, <laughs> but I've seen that with a lot of clients as you move through the process of healing, and getting rid of all of the stages, all the levels, not just parasite, you'll see parasites come out because you're strengthening your body and removing their grasp that they have on you. Makes total sense. They're like, okay, living's not good here anymore. I got to get no. out. Yep. Right. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so a starting point, then people can go to your website and do this questionnaire. Yep. And it's they go to my website, they can do the questionnaire. We have the full moon cleanse protocol on there. So if you wanted to do just an at home, a uh, couple time a year situation, it's built for that. And that can give you an idea of, you know, like, okay, I'm going to do this first one. And it's built with, it's built with sensitive, intermediate and advanced so I always recommend start sensitive, find out about yourself first before you start trying to go all ahead full. I know I probably would have started with advanced for myself because I'm just that kind of person. Might have paid for it. Might have had a bunch of herxes and bad feelings and detox reactions. But that's why we always tell people. And I go through and explain what that also looks like in the, the course. Um, and if you see a bunch of parasites come out and you feel like you need some more help, you're always welcome to give us a call. Mm, right. Well, and, and just to let people know too about that reaction, so when, when the parasites are dying off, they're, well, they're dying, so they're releasing stuff. And so that creates a, problems with us then too, right? So it's a good thing that they're dying off. It's just that it causes some negative uh, reactions in the short term. Is that correct? Yeah. So a detox die off or Herx reaction, they're kind of interchangeable about what they are. They are 
just like being hung over after drinking too much. Your body has a toxic response. And that toxic response is not feeling good. Usually it's whatever your symptoms are getting worse. So fatigue, brain fog, pain, achiness, poor sleep. These are common side effects of a detox reaction. Not everybody has them. You don't have to have a lot of them. But if you go too fast or too aggressively, then it's more likely that they'll happen. So that's why I always tell people, just start with the sensitive dosing. Start slow. Build up slowly. It'll make it ma majorly easier on you. Mm -hmm. And as a practitioner, it makes it easier on us when people want to go a little slower because they're not having the reactions where they're calling the office and not feeling well. That we, you know, we feel bad. We want to make sure people feel well. The goal is to get you feeling better, not worse. Not to say that it's a straight line to well, but it, it'll be a little bumpy, but right. we want to do the best we can to get that straight. Yeah. So good. All right. So the, your website is, you want to share that? It's my name, Dr. Javen Moore. D-R. Yes. D-R period J-A-B-A-N-M-O-O-R-E.com. Okay. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Now, I... Uh, is there anything we haven't covered yet that you want to make sure the audience hears? I know we kind of jumped around a little bit. I feel like that's a good one-on-one on parasites, a lot of good okay. details. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you. And I've always got one question, uh, Javen, for my guests. And that is, I want, this is all about wellness by design, right? Living by intention. So what's one intentional action someone could take today to improve their health? What would you suggest? Yeah. One action is stop feeding the parasites as most that you can. So my step is get rid of your plastic bottles, get yourself a glass or metal bottle and make sure the water that you put in it is clean. Mm -hmm. The way that I do that is I always drink distilled water mm -hmm. because distilled water is the cleanest thing, the cleanest way you can make water. Reverse osmosis is great. Bottled water is better than tap, but distilled is the best. And that's going to remove radioactive elements, metals, pharmaceutical byproducts, all sorts of things out of the water. Fluoride is going to make it clean so that you can stop feeding those parasites. And when you stop feeding them and they start starving, they might just evacuate on their own. <laughs> and do you, do you remineralize the distilled water afterwards? Do anything with it? I do. I use Cellcor CT minerals. Not everyone can. There are people that are a little sensitive to adding minerals back. If so, use Celtic sea salt. Oh, okay. um, or you can also simply just pay attention to your diet and make sure that your diet as a whole has is mineral rich. So you don't have to have minerals in water, although sometimes it's easy to do that for people that are on the go. And maybe your diet isn't quite as mineral rich as it should be, or maybe it's mineral rich as you want it to be. Do you have a, like a distilling machine at home or do you buy distilled water? What do you do? So before I, when plastic I, then, right? It's a problem. So when I learned about this, it was, okay, I can get distilled water in plastic bottles at the store. And I go, would I rather be drinking atrazine and uranium or plastic? So for me, knowing what I know about chemical toxicities, I'll take plastic over uranium. So it was a decision of best case scenario. And then, yes, I did order a stainless steel distiller. And that's what I have in my office, in my home. And that's what I've been using ever since. And that's, that's where we're at today. Oh, so I've got a Berkey filter. So that's not going to filter out everything, is it? It's not. Berkeys are great. I don't want people to go home and throw them away or be mad that they got them. Berkeys are great. They're a really good tabletop situation. Mm -hmm. They're not as good as distillation. They cannot remove radioactive elements. And you have to replace that filter quite often in a Berkey, maybe even more often than they tell you to, in my opinion, because what is a filter? It, it has water go through it. And as water goes through it, it's trying to pick up as much as it can. That's yeah. a good mechanism if that's all you can get. It's way better than tap. However, distillation evaporate over into another tank, which will allow for anything heavier than the molecule of water to stay. So then you get rid of all those metals and all those heavier things, those radioactive elements that are heavy, but really, really small because the radioactive elements are heavy, but they're teeny. Mm -hmm. So they can go through a filter, but they won't evaporate. Well, then you filter on the distiller in too. So you filter it and then you get your drinking water. And I tell you what, when you open that trap, um, the, the distillation 
container trap where all the toxins stays, where all the, yeah. the sediment stays. In a month, you'll have a quarter inch of sediment, at least in Kansas City, a quarter inch of sediment in there in, in between one to two months because we forgot to do it for two months. Uh. And we got in there and it was the whole bottom up the sides that far on top of the little ball thing that moves up and down to tell how much water's in there. I was just like, this is insane how much crap was pulled out of the water. Wow. And that's only a four gallon. I have a four gallon stabilizer, right? So it does four gallons at a time. And we don't go through four gallons a day. Like we go through a, a gallon and a half a day, two gallons a day. So 60 gallons, that's how much came out. My goodness, that is crazy. Okay. I think people are going to be feeling a lot differently about <laughs> drinking water and all the other foods they're eating too. This has been so interesting, Dr. Javen. Thank you so much for being my guest on Wellness by Design today. No, thank you so much for having me. And thanks to the audience for listening. And wasn't that interesting? I encourage you to go to Dr. Javen's website and have a look, do that test and see what you can find out. We may have probably are carrying around more parasites than we thought. So thanks very much and have a wonderful day.